Okay, welcome back. Uh, in this subsection of uh, this particular course, uh, as part of this particular course on um, friction and wire of materials, uh, I am giving this series of lectures, particularly that last few lectures on biomaterials and bioceramic materials. So, what I am planning to do in this lecture is to show you some of our published research results on dental restorative materials. Before I show you the results of the dental restorative materials, it is important for you to understand that what is how is the microstructure and properties of the natural tooth is like. So, this is the entire full tooth, whole tooth. So, what you see is the top is that enamel that most of us know and then comes the dentine. So, enamel and then comes a dentin which goes into the uh, root of this uh, dental cavity. Then you have a pulp cavity here which contains nerves and blood vessels. You have a root canal, all of you are aware of the root canal therapy. Then you have a periodontal membrane and then also this is the surrounding bone. So, certainly crown of this uh, uh, dental implant of the natural tooth would contain enamel and part of the dentine, whereas gingiva is the gum and the root part of this uh, natural tooth is uh, largely contains the pulp cavity as well as bone and uh, the dentine. So, we do not see any uh, bone in the top part this, uh, this crown part which contains all of enamel and some part of the dentine. Now, one of my former student uh, has done some careful analysis of the microstructure and then properties of this uh, natural teeth. So, he took uh, this uh, uh, lost tooth of several patients of different ages. So, this is the microstructure of the tooth of a uh, adult person and what you see if you take in the top part the crown you can see the some typical enamel like features. Then if you go down at the dental implant, so you have take a section right and if you take a section then you go down from dental to uh, from enamel to dentine. So, you have the DEJ that is a dental enamel junction and this is the part of that dentine here. So, he, this microstructure shows that what is the dentinal tubules very nicely. Now, these dentinal tubules are important because all these microstructural features they give rise to specific mechanical properties. Now, in terms of the content of this natural tooth, it is largely hydroxyapatite as you can see 95 percent is little bit of water and non-mineralized matter in, in case of the enamel. But in case of dentine, it is 70 percent hydroxyapatite and 30 percent is organic matter. So, so 30 percent organic matter like you know proteins and so on. An inorganic, inorganic material like hydroxyapatite is, uh, is contained in dentine like up to 70 percent. Now, if you take separate part of the enamel and dentine and do x-ray diffraction, what you see here there is a very clear indication of the hydroxyapatite phase and this hydroxyapatite phase is also crystalline in nature. So, you have a crystalline hydroxyapatite. As I said um, um, a few minutes back that, uh, that we have done very careful um, and systematic analysis by taking Vickers indentation. So, this is the small small Vickers indentation we have taken at different distance across the uh, across this uh, section from enamel to dentine enamel junctions to dentine and this is the result you get. So, hardness typically as expected enamel part the hardness is higher like 3 to 3 point uh, 2 to 3 giga Pascal. If it goes to dental enamel junction the hardness drops and if you go to the dentine junction the hardness is around 0.5 somewhere between around 0.75 giga Pascal. So, this 0.75 giga Pascal many materials they can uh, easily satisfy this kind of hardness requirement. However, the most important thing for you to realize here that there is a gradient in the hardness. 
So, this gradient in the hardness is more difficult to create in a given <laughs> microstructure. I am not saying it is impossible, but it requires a lot of it requires quite a bit of experiences from materials processing as well as microstructural designing, which is in the domain of the um, material science field. What is another thing that you must realize here that it is that careful um, EDS analysis, energy dispersive spectroscopy analysis, which can be done uh, together with the scanning electron microscopy analysis. And what you see that calcium content is reduced as you go from enamel to dentine region, so is the trend for the phosphorus and oxygen content is, does not change. So, what is saying that hydroxapatite content is typically reduced and what you have seen in that one of the earlier like earlier slides that enamel the hydroxapatite is 95 percent in dentine hydroxide 70 percent. So, one would expect that hydroxapatite phase also reduced and that is what has been reconfirmed using that EDS based compositional analysis. And you can see that how this indent they appear in this at this dentine enamel junction as well as the enamel part as well as the dentine part where you have this if you remember you have this uh, small small tubules micro tubules and you have a very clear well distinct uh, Vickers hardness impression in the dentine part as well. So, we have not only done the mechanical property characterization microstructure, but also we have done uh, this wear study, uh, fretting wear study on natural teeth. And what we have done, we have taken the teeth ball. What is teeth ball? Teeth ball is that we have taken this natural teeth in some teeth depending on the which part of the uh, mandible you have taken the teeth, then you can put this ball and the uh, one of the external surface of the tooth, you can slightly polished and then give it a shape like a ball. And then what we have done, we have taken that as an opposite counter body, matting body and alumina is the base plate. So, this is that alumina. So, why alumina? Because there has been a continuous search for all ceramic dental implant and in case of the all ceramic dental implant, one of the material which is very wide, which has been widely investigated is ceramic crown is alumina or zirconia. So, alumina and zirconia this ceramic uh, material which can be used as a dental replacement or dental restorative materials. So, from that point of view we have investigated whether alumina what is the friction and wear of alumina against that natural tooth. So, what are the cycles that we have used up to 10,000 cycles, but at different intermediate cycles also we have stopped the test just to show just to see that how wear progresses with time. What is the stroke length? It is fairly small this 30 microns the load has been taken very low 1 Newton because we are trying to simulate the masticatory forces uh, in that maxillo uh, in the in the oral cavity. And you, we have done some calculations where we have found that if you take the load of 1 Newton and if you consider the elastic modulus of the teeth ball and alumina then we are able to uh, we are able to uh, simulate the typical masticatory st masticatory action related uh, stresses or equivalent stresses at the contact zone. Now, this is the frictional behavior what you see as a function of cycles. So, this is like 10,000 cycles you can see very steady state behavior of around 0.1. So, remember this is the matting coupled tooth versus alumina. Okay. Now, at the larger number of cycles there is a variation and this variation it depends on we have to use the different teeth which is taken from different location and patient. So, essentially uh, that frictional property frictional frictional properties indicate that it is possible to measure low coefficient of friction like 0.1. Uh, and then this uh, test were also calculated with this these tests were done in the artificial saliva solution just to simulate that maxillofacial environment. Now, if you look at this transfer layer which is formed on this alumina surface, what you notice is that there is a very strong peak of calcium 
and essentially this transfer film what you see on that flat surface this is the alumina surface ok. So, essentially this is the transfer from the tooth. So, because it is a transfer from tooth that is why this so essentially tooth ball is fretted or worn away and then that is being transferred to that alumina surface leading to this transfer layer. Now, in order to in order to develop the dental distortive materials particularly the crown materials we have now I will show you some of the results that we have got by developing uh, mica based glass ceramics that is machinable glass ceramics. So, it has a typical composition and this is your uh, different basically oxide glasses essentially um, silica based oxide glasses and it has a alumina magnesium oxide K2O, B2O3 and also fluorine. Now, fluorine is typically there we, we use this NH4F as a precursor for B2O3 we have used HTBO3 as a precursor, K2O, K2CO3, white tabular alumina we have used and silica gel we have used in the powder form. So, this is the typical manufacturing protocol. So, we mix it then we melt the batch at 1500 or 1 hour in platinum crucible then we quench it into water to make free. But remember we have used this a multi component glass materials. So, in case of multi component one single melting is not good enough you have to do remelting. So, remelting essentially means you take the frit again you melt the frit at 1500 or 6 hours. So, if longer holding time or longer melting time essentially would ensure homogeneous compositional mixing in the melt state and what is expected that after you quench the melt then you can get the glass plate with uniform composition which is fairly important for better properties. Now, one can do this anneal of this glass plate at 250 degrees Celsius much much lower than melting temperature for 24 hours and just to release any or just to remove any residual stresses in the glass plate. And then after that one can we have done the secondary heat treatment of the glass at 1000 degrees Celsius or at different temperature 1000 to 11 20 degrees Celsius for 4 hours. This is one batch of glasses another batch of glasses we have done with increasing time like 8 hours 12 hours 16 hours 20 hours 24 hours but at fixed temperature 1000 degrees Celsius. What I am trying to point out here that this glass ceramic materials they are extremely interesting material because like metallic materials you can you can schedule different heat treatment conditions to get a variety of microstructures and often those microstructures are really fascinating in nature. And we are going to see some examples of the fascinating microstructures what one can obtain by changing this heat treatment conditions ok. So, to summarize we have done two type of heat treatment one is for different temperatures, but constant heat treatment time of 4 hours another one is the constant temperature, but different heat treatment time. So, by different heat treatment time with increasing heat treatment time one can expect that some microstructural characteristic phase would coarsen and that is that may happen. Then you can polish an edge with 12 percent HF solution just before the uh, microstructural characterization ok. So, that we have done. So, now let us see that what are the phases that are formed phase composition in the temperature variation batches we have got this fluorophlogopite that FPP, FPP this is that one of the important phase fluoro Flogopite. So, fluorophlogopite is this FPP stands for fluorophlogopite, and you see that these are very crystalline peaks at 1000 degrees for at 1000 is 4 hours it is amorphous glass there is no distinct peak ok. So, at 1000 degrees Celsius 4 hours you start seeing that some clear distinct peak of fluorophlogopite. 1080 degrees Celsius, 1011, 20 degrees Celsius, you see that most of the crystalline peaks actually appear. What it shows that now this glass ceramic materials, which is heat treated at 1120 degrees Celsius for 4 hours, it contains 
phase fewer fluoroflogopyl. Glasses and glass ceramic materials, these are the two different classes of materials. Typically, glasses means it is a completely amorphous phase, there is no crystalline phase. Glass ceramics means glasses which contain dispersed crystalline ceramic phases. So, when you are dispersing crystalline phases in an otherwise amorphous matrix, one could easily perceive that glass ceramic materials must have better mechanical properties in terms of hardness, strength and wear resistance. And we are going to see all these in the next few slides. So, this is for the temperature variation batches and this is for time variation batches. Again, this is the XRD patterns at 1000 is 4 hours, it is all amorphous. And as you increase the temperature uh, holding time, you can see some of the peak intensity or some of the peaks they appear. But here you do not see that much difference what you have seen the temperature batches, but mostly fluoroflogopite phase they appear as you increase the uh, temperature uh, holding time. It is not only fluoroflogopite phase, but also the volume fraction of fluoroflogopite also increases. Um, for example, from 8 hour to 24 hours, you can see at 24 hours fluorophagopite phase is close to 70 percent. So, 70 percent crystalline phase, 30 percent the glass amorphous. What you see at crystal volume fraction, it is 60 percent crystal volume fraction 1040 degree Celsius, but when you hit it at 11 20s, it reduces, but it is still close to around 45 volume percent of the crystal phase. Now, as I said few minutes back that you change the heat treatment conditions, you can expect different microstructures that can evolve. So, this is the clear case of the amorphous glass phase. So, you do not see any crystalline phases. Okay. Now, this is what the typical mica crystals that form. Now, what is interesting features of the mica crystals what you see here? Now, if you look at this, uh, although this micron bar is changed, so this micron bar uh, again, this micro the magnificence changed. These microcrystals, there is they are randomly distributed. There is no aligned growth of the microcrystals, and often they are interlocked. Interlocking means this microcrystal they grow in this direction. This microcrystal is growing in these directions. The moment this guy hits onto these growing mica plates then their growth is stopped. So, that is kind of interlocking mica crystals that is the best word. So, interlocking mica crystals that develops in this particular microstructure. And you one can also see that mica crystal can coarsen uh, that plate uh, mica crystal plate that plate width can increase with increasing the uh, heat treatment temperature, but while the holding holding time is the same. And you can see here, this is the typical, this is the 5 micron. So, essentially this is also roughly around 5 micron is the typical microcrystal width. And this is the science of this interlocking microstructures. You can see that this guy particularly is growing in this direction, this guy is particularly growing in this direction. The moment it hits, then this growth of this particular guy is stopped. And that is what is being shown in this particular uh, ACM images. Okay. So, by changing the heat treatment time, but keeping the heat treatment temperature at 1000 degrees Celsius, what you see here that a different microstructure develops. What is different microstructure? What you see that this is a butterfly type of microstructures, I will show you some more features. So, there is a central nucleating points and these crystals then grow, there is a multidirectional growth and this multidirectional growth leads to a butterfly kind of structure. So, this is one phase and this is also, this is also one of the butterfly crystals that forms at different, um, at different heat treatment time. Okay. Now, what you notice here? that this is a much more clear picture this this is 50 micron. So, essentially if you see that these butterfly crystals they have somewhere around 150 to 200 micron is the radius of this crystal. And this is a spherical kind of a crystal phase that appear that develops and this spherical crystal that is a center. And from center these different characteristic features of the butterfly that expand towards the 
edges of the butterfly crystal. This is kind of very fascinating, fascinating microstructural features. People have reported different other kind of features like cauliflower type of features, crystal feature, crystal morphology in the in different kind of glass ceramics. But this butterfly kind of crystal structure that was something new when we reported in this particular glass ceramic systems uh, a few years back. Okay. You will see that different kind of, of area of this butterfly crystal if you zoom it, you will see all these different features of the butterfly crystals. Uh, this is one of the features that you can see that how these crystal phases they grow in different directions. Okay. So, these are like more uh, observations that how these uh, butterfly crystals uh, they grow when the glass ceramics is heat treated at 1000 degrees Celsius for 20 hours. Now, these are some of the underlying scientific reasons that how this microstructure develops. Um, however, I think for this particular NPTEL course this may not be very relevant, but just for you to remember is that why if you change the heat treatment conditions you can essentially develop that uh, different butterfly crystal morphology or different type of morphology in this particular glass ceramic materials. Now, since these materials are potential dental glass restorative materials, therefore, we have also done uh, uh, not only tribe uh, fretting wet tester, but also scratch tester. So, the scratch tester uh, just to show that what is the scratch resistance in this material. So, you have an indenter and this indenter that will scratch pathway on this material and there will cracks that will be generated and you have the crystals also. The green color is the crystals and the red one is the cracks that is uh, that will be generated from the side of the scratch. So, essentially it simulates abrasive wear phenomena and also to some extent machining operation. We have done this scratch test not only in ambient conditions, but also in artificial saliva. Why artificial saliva? As I said that you are, we are trying to simulate the maxillofacial or oral environment. So, oral cavity contains saliva, but we have used that artificial saliva which is which we prepared in the laboratory and this is the case for 1000 degrees such as 16 hour sample and at 50 Newton uh, is a load on the scratch or the, on the scratch indenter and then you can see very significant cracking which is generated um, uh, in this glass ceramic materials leads to uh, uh, leads to uh, spalling of these uh, black butterfly crystals in this microstructure. The same thing we have seen the very deep cracks which is formed along the several uh, 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 around different locations in the butterfly crystals when we have done the uh, scratch test on a different materials. And you can see that there are already some materials is falling off and there is a deep cracking which can potentially lift off or spall off this particular butterfly microstructure. You can see very clear evidences of cracking in most of the microstructural regions wherever I am showing in this particular slide. Now, coming to tribological studies uh, like the case studies we have shown before, we have used that fretting wear tester and then in this particular case we have used the glass ceramic as a flat material and stainless steel as the ball material and it is 10 millimeter stainless steel. In order to simulate the ma masticatory action in the masti masticatory action related loading conditions, we have used that 1 Newton as a normal load and 100 micron is the reciprocatory uh, ampli sliding amplitude and 8 hertz is the frequency. And what you see here that one can calculate that what is the volume wear volume by these particular equations. So, in terms of the dry and artificial saliva, we did not find much difference in terms of the frictional properties. So, the frictional properties are very fairly comparable in the in case of the dry it is slightly lower, but these differences within the window of the standard error standard deviation. But we do notice reduction in wear rate when you conduct this test in the artificial saliva. So, what you see here at 5 new 5000 5, cycles, we see there is a drop in that wear rate 
at 50,000 cycles this is a further drop in the wear rate and 100,000 cycles again it is the further drop in the wear rate. Okay. Now, since establishing the wear mechanism is one of the kind of uh, one of the major th major uh, one of the major motivation for many material scientists. We have done this particular uh, this is the scanning electron microscopic images of this materials of this own surfaces and what you notice here that even after the test is done for 5000 cycles there is a very clear signs of the uh, delamination subsurface cracking as well as the cracking on the top surfaces top own surfaces all these features are very clear after the 5000 cycles. And as you go increase in the sliding condition sliding duration you will see that severity of this cracking is even more. So, this is the deep subsurface cracks which is which is uh, which is clearly visible and there is a deep deeper abrasive scratches also one can clearly notice along the fretting directions. So, all these features essentially contribute to the severe wear rate of these materials. In case of 50,000 cycles you will see that this wear uh, tribological uh, wear uh, own surface or, or own surface also contains very significant cracking, but here there is a very, very clear signatures of the tribochemical wear and this tribochemical layer it is cracked very significantly and then of the different parts of the tribochemical layer is kind of worn off. At 100,000 cycles you do see that wear debris particles in different contrast and these wear debris particles uh, this can lead to the three body wear situations also. And we can also see very deep cracking mostly it is in the perpendicular to the slide fretting directions and these deep cracks they are kind of responsible for causing extensive spalling of this tribal layer. So, overall what I have no, what I have observed what I have demonstrated that these glass ceramic materials which are being developed for dental restorative applications these glass ceramic materials can undergo wear in artificial saliva on environment to a much lower extent than what one can measure in the ambient conditions. So, these glass ceramic materials therefore, uh, can be a very potential uh, dental restorative materials. However, uh, what I have not shown, but we have uh, published that results is that these glass ceramic materials also support the cell adhesion and proliferation of the um, um, osteoblast cells. Osteoblast means that is the bone forming cells and also they have good antibacterial properties that means they have bactericidal properties the bactericidal properties again some of the pathogenic strains like Staphylococcus aureus, Staphylococcus epidermidis and so on. So, all these properties together make these glass ceramic materials macro machinable glass ceramic materials as a material of choice for dental restorative applications. Thank you.